I want to thank you all for joining us today. Our event is Facts of Life, Youth, Sexuality, and HIV. My name is Shereen El Fecky. I'm the moderator for today's session. I'm the Regional Director for the Middle East and North Africa at UNAIDS. My areas of research and advocacy are on sexualities and masculinities in the Middle East and North Africa. I've been described in the media as a sexpert, which I have to tell you is not a career option that my high school guidance counselor ever offered me. And there's a reason for that. And that's because sexuality and youth sexuality in particular in many parts of the world remains highly controversial. And if you want illustration of this, you need look no further to this high level meeting. As you know, there have been negotiations around the political declaration, which has been adopted, but there were really, really contentious discussions around sexual and reproductive health and rights and also comprehensive sexuality education. Now, what's really interesting is that the same governments that speak very loudly about uh, helping young people to reach their potential in public life, whether it's to do with uh, youth economic uh, and employment opportunities or young people's civic engagement, are also the same governments which take a very different tone when it comes to giving young people the information and the services they need to reach their potential in their private in their intimate lives. And the consequences of this gap, of this denial, are very clear to see. I mean, it's in the context of sexual and, sexual and gender-based violence that young people may encounter, unintended pregnancies, unsafe abortion, stigma and discrimination, uh, and of course, exposure to uh, STIs, vulnerability to STIs. And all this, this impact has been given far greater punch for young people because of COVID-19. Now, when it comes to HIV in particular, the consequences of this denial, this neglect of youth SR, HR services and information are very clear. Nearly half of all HIV infections in the world are amongst young people aged 15 to 24. HIV is the second leading cause of death amongst young people in the world, and it's the leading cause of mortality for young people in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the good news is that the global AIDS strategy for 2021 to 2026 recognizes this dilemma and it really speaks very strongly to the need to empower young people to build today's and help lead tomorrow's global HIV response. This is fantastic and I urge you to read the global strategy. It has so many recommendations on, uh, on, on what to do. The question is, how do we, how do we get this change? How do we turn from recommendation into action? And that's what we're here to discuss today with our A team of uh, young people, young activists, um, experts in sexual and reproductive health and rights, and government representatives. We're looking forward to a very free and frank discussion, and we're delighted that so many of you have joined us today. Before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping. We are delighted to see so many of you with us. Uh, if you feel more comfortable um, listening in in Arabic or French or Spanish, please press on the interpretation globe below and you can switch on to the new channel thanks to our intrepid uh, interpreters. For those of you who are watching us on YouTube, apologies, we don't have interpretation there. And so if you would like to listen in another language, I would urge you to uh, follow the link, which should be appearing, this, this, the link to this Zoom call, it should be appearing in the YouTube chat now. Follow that link and you will come to this call and you'll be able to access the interpretation. The same thing applies to questions and comments. We're really, really hoping for, lots and lots of questions for our panelists and from hearing from you in the audience. Um, because of some technical limitations, we will be monitoring the chat here in Zoom, but we won't have an opportunity to do that in YouTube and apologies for that. Again, if you wanna be part of this conversation and please, we would love to hear from you. Follow the Zoom link, come into the uh, session through this Zoom call 
and then we're looking forward to seeing a busy conversation in the chat. Now, finally, just in terms of asking questions, uh, when you have a question, please uh, indicate it in the chat with the letter Q for question. Uh, please indicate your name and uh, your affiliation organization and the country you're from. And also if your question refers to any particular speaker or speakers, please let us know whom you'd uh, like to have addressed the question from the panel. Well, that is great. Um, I think that's enough housekeeping for one session, so let's get started. We've divided this uh, program into three parts, and in the first part, we're going to really define what we mean when we talk about reproductive health and rights and, and for young people, and what do young people really want, as opposed to those in power telling them what they should have. This first speaker, I'm delighted to welcome friend and colleague uh, Alvaro Bermejo, who is uh, Director General of IPPF. I want to actually give a special shout out to IPPF. They are co-sponsors of this uh, session with UNAIDS, and we're so grateful for uh, their collaboration on this. So Alvaro, we want us to take you to, for you to take us through the big picture. I mean, let's very clearly define our terms, because there's a lot of uncertainty, I think. What is it when we are talking about youth, SRHR? How does it connect to HIV? And frankly, why is it still so controversial in 2021? Over to you, Alvaro. Thank you, Shireen. And um, congratulations on having organized this as part of the HLM. I think it is very important that we have a chance to really debate the issues as they um, affect young people and as they young people respond to them and react and react to what we have seen during the last few days in New York, which I have to say um, gives even the more reason for having this. In the world today, there are approximately 1.8 billion adolescents and young people aged between 10 and 24. Those are UNFPA data who also says that 90%, 90% of these adolescents live in developing countries. Whatever we want to believe, reality is that most will experience their first sexual encounter before the age of 16. Average age for sexual debut globally is 15.7 years old. So young people are having sex while their older politicians and representatives are in New York discussing whether we can even mention sexuality and young people in the same sentence, whether we can talk about comprehensive sexuality education. And 15.7 years old is the average for sexual debut. We know that in some settings around the world, that age, particularly for girls, is significantly lower as a result of harmful practices such as child marriages. We also know to make the link with HIV that adolescent girls and young women aged 15 to 24 years account for 25% of new infections in Sub-Saharan Africa, even though they make only 10% of the total population. And we know that family planning platforms to which many of these girls are going remain the most underutilized resource for HIV prevention. We have these data. And we have decades of research supporting comprehensive sexuality education, showing that knowledge, agency, and inclusion will empower and protect young people. And as you said, Shireen, we still find ourselves unable to get into this political declaration, comprehensive sexuality education as it should be. And we know that the lack of reference to it will create opposition and significant barriers to implementation. So why is it not there? It is not there because populist macho politicians and churches advances, advancing distinct religious identities fuel anxieties and panic about sexuality and sexual behavior of young people. They drive an assumption or maybe I should say an assertion that individuals engage in sexual activity only after marriage and their concept of marriage is limited to heteronormative unions. These macho politicians 
These churches want us to believe it is ignorance, fear and submission rather than knowledge and agency that will protect young people. IPPF is one of civil society's largest providers of comprehensive sexuality education in the world. I can give a couple of examples to illustrate the situation that a political declaration without clear unequivocal endorsement of comprehensive sexuality education and youth-centered sexual and reproductive health services will create. To give two examples, 2019, the government of Ghana launched national guidelines on comprehensive sexuality education after two long years of consultation with different stakeholders, including young people. These guidelines were intended to provide the policy framework for the delivery of CSE to young people in Ghana. And then it confronted intense opposition from the religious and traditional leaders. The government withdrew the guidelines that same year and banned the delivery of CSE. Sexual and reproductive rights partners have only recently been able to restart the process of getting revised national guidelines on the way to approval. That's one example. I could list many. Another member association started delivering CSE in schools. However, this provoked religious opposition, which branded our member association as promoting hom homosexuality and blacklisted them for doing any further work in this area. The National Assembly voted against the program, and as a result, it got stopped in schools. And it is only now, again, after many more months and years working with, directly with young people that the member association has been able to rebrand its program as life skills sessions, so eliminated the word sexuality, while still incorporating some of the CSE topics in order to avoid further backlash. I think it is time that we're fully accountable to young people, that the General Assembly, that the UN ambassadors, that all of those that sit and make these declarations, listen to them, that we create trusted platforms through which they can access information and that we trust them to make decisions that are right for them. So I plea to politicians, ambassadors, listen to what these young people have to say today at this event. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Alvaro, for that heartfelt uh, a call uh, to action and appreciate uh, the concrete examples you've provided of, of progress, but also setbacks and all the challenges we face. From that big picture, we're now going to put it into very personal perspective. And it really gives me great pleasure to welcome our next speaker, who's uh, Nippon. Uh, Nippon, I never asked you how to pronounce your surname, so apologies in advance, but uh, Shri Vastava, uh, I hope. Close. Excellent. Thank you, Nippon. Uh, Nippon is uh, an HIV uh, activist. He's based in Delhi. Uh, Nippon, you know, we're talking about the big picture here. From your hard-won personal experience, tell us why access to sexual and reproductive health information and service is so important to you as a young person. And frankly, what are the consequences when we get it wrong? Over to you, Nippon. Thank you, Shireen, um, and good day to everybody. Uh, my name is Nipun, and I'm an LGBTQI and HIV activist based out of India. Um, a paragraph and just two diagrams of male and female sex organs. That was the extent of the sex education provided to me and my classmates when we were in school. Mind you, this was not in the 1980s and the 90s when sex education was barely discussed. This was in 2008. In India, discussion on sex, sexuality, and gender does not happen under the guidance of teachers and informed peer counselors, but through browsing hours and hours of porn websites and chatting with shady strangers far older to us on social networking sites. We are left to our own devices to figure out vital information about our own bodies, our sexualities, and the issue of contraceptives and STIs. The mess of digital overdose of information on the internet also does not provide clarity of information. Instead, it clouds the minds of young people even more. In my own experience, uh, sex education 
we barely had one page to cover the most information about our bodies, but multiple chapters to cover types of pollination and flowers and various animal and insect physiologies of cows, goats, chickens, and bees. If only our bodies were treated at par with bodies of little birds and bees. As a queer person who identifies with he, they pronouns, it was more than difficult to find access to education about my own sexuality and gender. There was little support for education on LGBTQI rights in schools. Teachers turned an unsympathetic eye to pressing issues of puberty. They could not care less about queer bodies. There was no education on protection by condoms and contraception, very little communication about HIV AIDS and other STIs in schools, and virtually no safe spaces to seek out in case we had any questions about our changing bodies or just wanted to openly discuss about what's going on with us. The only sources for information for a 14-year-old queer boy like me were awkward chat rooms and interacting with internet strangers, some of whom became friends and some necessarily did not have best intentions in their minds. Over the years, I would solicit sex through sometimes safe and sometimes unsafe encounters with strangers on internet who were far older to me. I would also access information about my own sexuality by connecting with queer elders in my own community. But there was still a discernible lack of information still with regards to gay sex, the only avenue again through porn or talking to queer elders who have gone through the same dismissive experience about their sexualities and bodies. I had learned about PrEP through the internet, but I was unable to access it, even in an urban setting like New Delhi. Finally, amidst my encounters of sex with multiple men, I contracted HIV. I don't want my experience to be repeated by any person, queer or straight. In my case, it was a lack of information provided to me about my body, which led to my diagnosis and my inability to get PrEP access even in an urban setting like Delhi. So what's a simple solution to all of this? Let's talk about sex freely. Let's talk about sexuality openly, all different shades of it. But that seems to be the contentious debate even today. Mind you, we are in the third decade of the 21st century, and yet sex and sexuality is the taboo topic that we have been running away from. In the political declaration this year, China, Russia, and Iran, and some other African countries try to delete allusions to sexual or gender identity and to sex education to girls. Some countries wanted to delete sections on matters related to sexuality altogether. Luckily, they failed. But are we being serious? We have an ambitious target to end AIDS by 2030, something that is not achievable with these regressive and ridiculous policies on sex, sexuality, and gender. Youth, and most importantly, adolescent reproductive and sexual health rights needs to be given top priority as this is one of the most impressionable age groups. We have lost a generation of young people by not talking about AIDS in the 1980s. Let's not make the same mistake by not talking about SRHR in the 80s. And let's, let's not talk by for all. Silence on any of these issues is not meeting our targets. Silence on any of these issues is not ending AIDS. Silence means death. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Nippon. Uh, we clearly know what is at stake here. And so in the second part of the program, we're going to look at how governments from around the world are stepping up to meet these challenges and the obstacles that they are facing and how they are trying to maneuver around them. First amongst our government representatives to speak uh, is Nadia Abdallah. She's a chief administrative a secretary. Nadia, you have a very long ministry, so I'm going to read it out here. Um, she is with the Ministry of ICT, Innovation and Youth in Kenya. 
Um, Nadia is in an unusual position in that she is a young person, but she's also a government uh, official, a, a deputy minister. So she is sitting at the nexus of personal experience, but also a professional uh, capacity. So Nadia, I'd really like you to draw upon that personal and professional perspective to tell us about how, as a young person in Kenya, you, how your experiences have shaped what you're trying to do and your government more broadly to address the challenges that uh, Nippon and Alvaro have mentioned, which are also present uh, in Kenya. And also, what are the challenges, what are the obstacles that you're facing to really meet young people's needs when it comes to sexual and reproductive health and rights, um, and of course in included within that um, access to information and services for HIV? Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, distinguished guests, uh, realizing sexual and reproductive health rights in Kenya is still a myth in some parts of the country. Um, unmet needs still remain high and violations continue to be experienced. And this is in uh, terms of lack of information, cultural and structural barriers, discrimi <clears throat> discrimination and stigma. Uh, not forgetting violence and harassment, uh, limited access to and unaffordable uh, services and exclusion from decision-making processes. My experience with some of these barriers enables me to give a number of fundamental recommendations in my ministry and other stakeholders to consider during our policy dialogues, programming and other measures aimed at enhancing the realization of sexual and reproductive health rights of every young Kenyan. So in responding to the P, uh, young people's HIV and SRHR needs, my ministry has put uh, concrete efforts to upholding the young people's health rights by number one, providing strategic direction in formulation of policies and guidelines that create an enabling environment for SRHR and the reduction of HIV infection, the stigma and AIDS related deaths among young people. Um, a, good, a good example uh, would be we jointly reviewed the adolescence and reproductive health um, uh, development policy with the Ministry of Health to provide guidance to the government agencies and development partners on how to respond to young people's HRSR needs. Um, we also have recently reviewed the Kenya Youth Development Policy that provides an additional platform to advocate for utilization of healthcare facilities uh, by the youth, as well as improvement of knowledge and attitude towards the SRHR among the youth, the parents, the teachers, religious leaders, and community members. Um, this policy usually advocates the youth-centered models for the optimal HIV prevention universal access to treatment and care services to promote uh, testing options like HIV self-testing kits, psychological interventions, as well as stigma reduction to promote positive living for the young people. We've also looked into enhancing access to information, services, and education for young people by really promoting and enabling the youth-friendly environment for youth to be able to make free and informed decisions and choices about their sexuality and reproductive lives to adequately protect themselves from all forms of sexual and gender-based violence and harmful practices, STIs, including HIV AIDS, through the two models that we have. One is the youth empowerment centers, where we provide reproductive health counseling or linkages and HIV counseling and testing. And another one is the integration, integration of HIV and SRHR health components across all the youth empowerment platforms. We're also committing to the notion that nothing about young people's health and well-being can be discussed and decided upon without the meaningful involvement and participation of the young people. This enables us to provide youth with um, opportunities that ensure their issues are well presented. For example, the formulation of the health policy. Um, as you know, the youth remain uh, affected by poverty, violence, and injustice that make them vulnerable to HIV, thus uh, limiting their freedom to enter and remain in labor force. This ultimately impacts their economic independence, security, decision-making, and control. And to reduce their vulnerability to HIV, we really promote youth empowerment through implementation of education and economic opportunities, including entrepreneurships and employment by facilitating other supportive measures and interventions such as provision of grants, of loans, and business development services in order to harness it all. 
you know, recognizing our different capacities and responsibility as a ministry and as young people will help us to continue fostering strategic partnership, including young people and their development and their civic education and society as a whole. So as a local community, as young people, as leaders, and as a government, it is important that we are really implementing actions to express in a specified way the commitments and the key programs in order to action their delivery on the promises towards HIV, AIDS, STIs, together with SRHR education. So to us, optimal information for the young people and educating them and giving them a platform and an environment where it is very safe for them to speak. It is very safe for them to, ex uh, to express themselves. By the same time, it is very safe for them to know that they're represented is one of the most important element when it comes to our government and when it comes to young people and a young person as myself. So we promote a very open discussion with young people and being a young person and in a leadership position, it is important for me to be able to also echo those to my fellow young people around. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Nadia, for point about young people being in positions of decision making, not just the implementers, but also the crafters of the programs that uh, are intended to empower them. I did also I thought it very interesting that you put SRHR in the bigger picture of um, youth uh, development in the political and economic and social context. It's not a standalone. It's, it's like a tapestry that weaves together. So many thanks for sharing those experiences from your country. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Amory Brown. Uh, Amory is uh, the Minister for Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, and he's joining us from Trinidad. Hello, good morning. I hope yes, you're Dr. hearing me. Trail. Yes, Dr. Amri, please go ahead. Okay. Distinguished guests, good morning and thank you for the organization of this excellent side event. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity for politicians, policymakers, and other stakeholders to come together to discuss what is really a topic of life and death. Um, the, the, this discussion on issues is really critical to the health and well being of our young people, which comprise the future of our countries and the future of our species. Let me start by saying that long before I became a politician, I was at the front lines of the effort against HIV and other sexually transmitted infections as a medical doctor in our nation's STI clinics. And I really was able to see firsthand the effects of young people and children being denied the life skills and basic information needed to properly develop, to cope and to negotiate their sexuality. And we've gotten some already during this discussion, some stark examples of uh, what can be the, the challenges arising out of that, that denial. And I was, uh, had the unfortunate position of seeing school age youth and other young people coming in and presenting with syphilis, herpes, HIV, and a range of other infections. There has been significant progress made in my country and in my region, in Trinidad and Tobago, and in CARICOM as a whole since that era, but much work is still required and demanded. 
in Trinidad and Tobago, health and family life education is now provided in government schools across the country. But the issue of comprehensive SRH education is still, to an extent, taboo, is still strongly challenged by religious and conservative groups. And yes, these groups do have their champions, which are sometimes opinion leaders, and yes, sometimes politicians as well. It is my view that on the national and on the global scale, further progress on this life and death issue will not be achieved by name calling or shouting at countries or stakeholders, but a, a strategy must continue to be engaged that continues the process of dialogue with key stakeholders. That dialogue must be inclusive and consistent. We must continue to utilize civil society uh, on a, an, to an even greater extent to access groups and carry messages that might be challenged from government sources or more formal sources. We must identify and work more with key allies and potential allies to achieve comprehensive SRHR education provision, uh, especially in smaller societies and in societies where the conservative and religious voices tend to dominate some of the popular discourse. And what I've found is that uh, in identifying and working with key allies, even some of our religious leaders, priests, imams, pundits, uh, maybe not across the board, but we have been able to identify and work with some key opinion leaders within these groups. And that's where some of the progress has been facilitated. But, facilitated. but as I said, there's much more work to be done. And then the, the other message is really to listen, to learn, and to implement where possible. Uh, it has not been easy, the transition from uh, more of an, an activist, a participant in civil society, to a position of political leadership, contribution at the level of cabinet has not been easy because as a, as a government, one has to press for change. One has to provide uh, the this, this skills and ensure that our young people are able to, to survive in the modern world to a greater extent than in the past. But at the same time, uh, the governments have the responsibility to listen to all voices in society. And therefore, the expectation of an autocratic response or exclusion of some of those very strong voices that might be limiting progress cannot be achieved uh, as an overnight step or an automatic step. And, and that's where I think the balance has to be struck. At the end of the day, I would want to, to end right where I began. We are speaking about life and death. Um, we are speaking about the future of our species. And even in the era of COVID-19, and particularly in the era of, of COVID-19, this discussion is critical. Uh, as a young, politician, somewhat young politician, I continue to do my part working with other allies in my own country, in the CARICOM region, and across the world, building a network that can continue to engage positively and shift the balance more in the direction that would facilitate our young people being able to receive life skills, information, and education that can help them develop successfully, avoid uh, sexually transmitted infections, and to become uh, key components of the future of mankind. That work continues.
Hi, many thanks. Amory, thank you for your remarks. And I, I just want to pick up on many of the points that Amory made, but in particular, you're talking about the respect for the opinions of others and the delicate balancing act that governments face. And, and I really do want to underline this point of respect and tolerance for diversity, because we've had some very unfortunate, frankly, completely unacceptable comments in the chat. And, and really, I urge us all, I know this is a really sensitive subject, but part of the reason that we want to see comprehensive sexuality education is that the principles that it teaches of uh, respect and tolerance and um, uh, equality are important, not just in our intimate lives, but in all aspects of our lives, including in the conversations that we're having on this chat. Uh, so uh, apologies to everyone that uh, this unfortunate incident uh, occurred. We are back, we're going to be back in with the chat and we're looking forward to questions and comments. Uh, and thank you, uh, Amory, for your remarks that have really set the tone uh, for uh, this session. We're now going to change, move uh, parts of the world. We're gonna travel a bit from Trinidad and Tobago to the European Union. And I'm very happy to welcome on the panel, uh, Gabriela Fesas. And Gabriela, um, Gabriela heads a unit which also has a very long title. So I'm just going to read it out here. Um, it's Social Inclusion and Protection, Health and Demography in the Directorate General for International Partnership at the European Union. Welcome, Gabriela. Gabriella, we're switching tracks here a little bit, talking about donors and why they would prioritize youth SRHR in the midst of you know, so many development challenges, clearly ever more so uh, in the wake of COVID-19. Why is youth SRHR important for the European Union? And what are you doing <laughs> to help empower young people in this regard? Over to you, Gabriella. Thank you very much, uh, Shireen, and thank you very much to UNAIDS for inviting us, uh, for inviting the EU to this inspiring meeting and inspiring panelists. I think a number of important messages have been made, and certainly from the EU side, we are honoured to be considered a leading donor and wish also to contribute to uphold young people's bodily autonomy and sexual and reproductive health and rights. So starting with the second part of your question, why is it a priority for us? So, well, uh, basically what the world uh, has never been so young with youth aged 15 to 24 representing 1.2 billion people in 2019. And in Africa alone, three quarters of the population is below 35. So certainly investing in and working with uh, by and for youth is, is of paramount importance for us. And as we could hear today, uh, young people are facing many important challenges and not least linked to sexual and reproductive health rights, access to contraceptives is critical for young women's and girls' empowerment. And we are, we are worried because we are seeing a worrying trend that the already high levels of early and unintended pregnancies, as also mentioned today among adolescents, is increasing in a number of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. And as we could also hear from you know, previous speakers that SRHR information and services, including self-determined family planning, safe abortion where legal, should be accessible and affordable to all, all individuals. And so we are very glad that, you know, in the context of the high level meeting on HIV AIDS, uh, we can highlight, you know, once again, that SRHR information ed education is critical uh, for HIV prevention. And we also know that more than 80% of new HIV infections among 15 to 19 years old in Sub-Saharan Africa are girls. I don't think I need to list for you all the policy documents of the EU, which underlines the importance of, of SRHR but I will now rather focus on what concretely are we doing. Now in the EU, we are just starting the funding cycle for the next seven years. We have a new instrument for development cooperation, which clearly offers opportunities to support SRHR and universal health coverage. And we have specific spending targets for investments in human development and gender equality. We will be continuing to provide direct country support uh, through bilateral programs on health and SRHR, gender equality, women's and girls empowerment. And the commission will also continue to support SRHR at the global and regional level. As you are certainly aware, the EU supports global health 
initiatives through the UNFPA supplies partnerships, which, which we intend to continue, and uh, access to family planning in low and middle income countries uh, needs to be strengthened, and also through the Global Fund uh, to fight AIDS, and especially among adolescents, girls, and young women uh, is, is addressed. And you are also certainly aware the EU UN Spotlight Initiative also contributes to addressing persistent inequalities in health outcomes. We have an initial investment of 500 million earmarked for SRHR actions in Africa, which we intend to scale up. We also have launched a call for proposals specifically targeting addressing the needs of adolescents uh, SRHR in Sub-Saharan Africa, which, which we are currently uh, closing. And finally, I would also like to tell you that uh, our commissioner, Commissioner for International Partnerships, or um uh, Jutta Urpilainen attaches high priority to both SRHR but also to young people, how to engage more and consult more young people in all policy areas. So we, di we did recently through the report Your Voice, Your Future with UNICEF and the African Union where we consulted 45,000 children and young people from Europe and Africa on the future of the African Union and European Union partnership. We are also setting up a youth sounding board for international partnership where young people from around the world are being selected, 25 of them, that will directly advise our commissioner on youth participation and empowerment. And similar structures of youth, youth engagement in the EU action are being created in, in our partner countries. So we feel that, you know, we really want to strengthen consultation with youth and certainly SRHR is one of, one of the key areas we will continue to very much focus on in the future. Thank you very much again for having the opportunity to be here today. Many thanks, uh, Gabriella. Uh, that's a terrific overview. And, and thank you also for, we've been speaking so much about comprehensive sexuality education, absolutely key, but touching on the importance of service provision and also integrating that into uh, the bigger picture of uh, health system strengthening, universal health coverage. This will only work not only if young people are part of the SRHR fabric in our societies, but also if SRHR is not a standalone. As if, it, if it too is woven into uh, our health systems and our broader social protection uh, systems uh, that are emerging, clearly, you know, the compelling need that COVID-19 has highlighted for us. We're going to round up, round off this section of the program uh, with Yena uh, Peniflova. If Yena looks familiar, it's because you will have seen her earlier this week. She was speaking at the opening uh, plenary uh, at the high level meeting. Uh, Yena is an HIV activist from uh, the Ukraine and she is the founder of Teenergizer. Uh, Yana, in, in, you've had some wonderful opportunities in your, uh, in your young uh, but action-packed life uh, to engage with politicians from around the world. Uh, you've heard from our uh, esteemed panelists uh, representing governments on, in this session as well. You know, what, do you, what, do, what do you say? What do you say from your perspective as a young uh, person living with HIV, as an activist in this space, what do you say to those in, in power? It, what do you want, what do you and your peers want from those uh, in authority to really help you uh, to stay free of or you know, successfully live with HIV? Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for organizing this session because it's much important session because now we're talking about like adolescent health, especially sexual reproductive health and rights uh, among adolescents. So uh, for my side, you know, like I'm now I'm 23 years old. I was born with HIV. So it's sometimes it's hard to me to talk my mother about like sex education. In uh, school, uh, I, I couldn't talk with my teachers and someone else to talk about like com comprehensive sexuality education and we didn't have like we didn't have the really quality information in internet because now we have the really big a lot of information about comprehensive sexuality education etc so um so that's we we just stayed uh together and we just talk about with our peers and we we just like to, to find to find this this answer for our a lot of a lot of questions. So uh, then when when I have been have been like 
uh, organizing like teenagers, uh, creating new um, like like groups of teenagers who living with HIV, who without HIV, and we talk about like comprehensive sexuality education, for example, in Ukraine, and also of course teenagers work in not only Ukraine. We are working in Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan. Um, and last two two years, we also work it in Georgia. Yeah, and for for ours, it's sometimes hard because um, be, because um, be, because our garments don't hear us, and they didn't didn't want to hear us, and they share like some isolations, like illusions of the society is not uh, to support for this topic, and that's why we uh, they don't didn't want and don't want to implement comprehensive sexuality in school and uh, this is like because we have been working for these topics more than two years but then on the hand if we see the if we see the reasons why it's needed right now yeah because the a lot of adolescents don't know how to use the condoms uh the main uh way of transmission on HIV. It's like uh, heterosexual sex in our region. Uh, and of course, and of course, we, uh, a lot of adult people who works in, uh, who work in, um, in garments, they think that they told us that, okay, if we talk about the comprehensive sexuality education, uh, that's why the teenager can start starting to have a sex. So and sometimes we see a lot of stereotypes in the governments in the people who make decisions for about our about our health and but okay uh the other hand we would like to work with this uh and you don't know because we have been working more than two years for these topics uh and of course sometimes it's, it's really hard uh and of course we didn't know uh, how many young people and especially adolescents living with HIV in our countries because the governments didn't collect the data and we don't really know what, what the real situation in um, in um, in our countries. But I would like to share with you some like small data. Um, I think it's more you think more clearly understand what's happened maybe in 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 our countries. For example, in um, like HIV epidemic is growing among general population in our region. In 2016, there were 129,000 adolescents aged like 10 till 19 old at risk of HIV infections. It's like data of UNAIDS and UNICEF. And the next, the next uh, year, we got like the 100. We got new, 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 new data like like uh, 120, 130, sorry, 130,000 adolescents at the same age. So it, 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 we talk about like about this data, but now we don't have the data like uh, for this few few years ago. So uh, I think the first one uh, for us it's much important if we providing some collecting the data, um, not only like about how, about the services, but of course into school how uh, what people what's the, what the real studies what the, like the teenagers get uh, about HIV and what the knowledge about the HIV because for example three days ago I went from Ukraine and I got some really sad situation uh, but bad situation that uh in our uh, the right answers for about like transmission on HIV AIDS, uh, the right questions who agreed it by ministers of uh, education is like which the way HIV is transmission and our like guide answer for uh, through kiss and that's why it's really shocked I I'm so shocked about this information because because you know like we have now in 21 century and we know a lot of information about HIV but our governments provide us is not quality information i think we need to more controlling for the governments and and that's why we need to support um, to support young organizations who work in this area i mean not only the money yes but but 
the uh, like the, the investing the capacity building because a lot of young people don't really know the other hand uh, i think it's really important and highly um, appreciated for example it's energizer because now uh, the 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 covid pandemic 19 we saw that a lot of young people stay at home and just study online and this is like it's not sometimes as good because uh, the 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 teenagers don't don't stay like a lo- long time because they just need to do more quickly. They have a lot of energy inside. So uh, we provide them the peer to peer trainings about comprehensive sexuality education uh, through online uh, because it's much easier peers to talk about sex and sexuality, not to adult people because some um, some people like adult people it's. It, like they, they they don't feel comfort comfortable in our countries to talk about this so uh that's i'm just like share with my view like i'm just like describing what's happened in our countries and f- for first one i think we need to like to support and to uh, help the young organization to implement for comprehensive sexuality education and to do to make like to be stronger uh the next one um the comprehensive sexuality education now is needed and we need to add all the position like the data like the um knowledge like uh, to see what, what what the situation is change and what the behaviors of, of, of the change um especially because now of the trends um of the young people is like change and the last one um of course, we need to make, uh, work with the social uh, social media, especially with the uh, opinion leaders, because young people sitting in the on online, and we need, of course, to work in online spheres through for these guys. Thank you so much. Terrific, Yana. Thank you for covering a wide range of, of points, and there's so much there. But just to pick up on peer 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 led peer centered peer created uh, services so important and, and really the element of trust as well um, to really build the connections between generations that we we trust young people if we give them if we give you the information and the services that you need that you will make the right decisions and it's really the deficit of trust uh, that we need to be addressed and I have to say there are some fantastic comments in the chat. Uh, which are really incredibly moving. They're picking up on many of your points. Um, Irene, uh, in particular, Irene, thank you for your moving personal uh, testimonials. I I would urge you all to to have a look at at these. I'm just gonna pick up on one or two questions now, and uh, then we'll move into the final uh, section of the program. Uh, But um, we have a a great question from uh, Niluka Ferreira. Um, I hope I pronounced that uh, properly. Um, And Niluka says, I've started working with youth HIV, SRHR issues when I was 21. I am now 32. After almost 10 years, we are still talking about youth-friendly services, CSE, age of consent laws, etc. And we still have Russia and like-minded countries opposing all of this. Uh, plus the whole concept of human rights at the UN. Uh, Niluka is asking, what did we do wrong? Why are, essentially, why are we still in this place? Anyone like to take this one on? Um, Nippon, great. Um, Amory, um, given your position as a Minister of Foreign Affairs, perhaps you've also been, you've been involved in international negotiations. You know, why aren't we further, why aren't we further ahead? given all these decades of conversation? Well, it's, it's a very important question. Um, I would say you can look at it from two perspectives. Progress has been made. A number of countries have made significant advancements and uh, young people are, do have a stronger voice now, uh, both nationally and globally than they had when I was 21. That's significant and we need to acknowledge that progress. Uh, There have been advancements with respect to what is provided in schools, certainly in my country and elsewhere, but 
we have to recognize that so much more work has to be done. I do agree that the, the fact that these topics, the very topics are still controversial in the year 2021 is an indictment on how we do business uh, as, you know, as, as countries and as politicians, as, as uh, leaders. Why, why have we not made further progress? That just speaks to the powerful undercurrent of religion, of conservatism, of uh, the, the fact that sex and sexuality generally are, are considered taboo. Um, and there's still a degree of ignorance that this, this thought that if you expose the young to some of the, the information and skills, this will lead to premature or precocious sexual activity and lead to risk. So not all of the pushback comes from an ignoble place. The, I, I do believe there are some stakeholders that still genuinely feel that to resist SRH is somehow protecting young people. And that's where consistency of, of the messages are pressing ahead and involving, you know, denigration of those who have different views is important. And I do believe that change will continue. I see some very passionate young people here and, you know, engaged in these matters. Change will, will uh, continue to be achieved. Um, so just remain resolute uh, and, and press on with these matters. Thanks. Thanks, Emery. You know, there is this sort of interesting um, paradox here that it appears that, you know, we turn 35, right? You cross the threshold of 35, and then somehow you suddenly forget what it was like to be a young person. And so, you know, that we, you know, those of us who are older than 35, are, you know, we had all the same questions and the concerns and the fears and the curiosity. So it, it's very strange that, that either we, you know, collectively forget or we choose to deny but why would we want to repeat the problems that we faced as young people and visit those on another generation? I, I, I find it really paradoxical. And, 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 and it's, it's a, there's a lot of self-realization and you know, facing up to facts, facts of life that those of us who are, in, uh, who are older now need to, need to face as well. And it's great, as you said, for the young people who are finding a voice that wasn't as easy before in the time before social media to really be heard when the channels were very narrow, that these voices are increasingly coming to the fore as in this, as in this panel. Um, I think on this question, Nippon, did you also want to come in on why isn't there more progress? Uh, well, I think that it's uh, because of, uh, I think it's just that we, there is, uh, uh, in, in at least like in the Middle Eastern context, like, you know, there has been the, idea i mean like dr shireen has like you know given a huge it's it's a brilliant uh, ted talk that she's given about how uh, the, 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 there is a, a sense of um, sexuality education that that exists for in in quran and so on and so forth and it's like you know there is like you know that that sense of empowerment for youths uh, in 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 the before before like you know the colonization happened and before the before like you know there was this whole idea of like you know oh sexuality is and sex is something which is wrong so i think we need to really debunk the conservative argument altogether and say that this is absolutely not okay and uh, that you know we when we talk about sex and sexuality we need to talk about it from the regional context as well we need to talk about it from the context of like you know if you're living in arabia uh, uh, in, in an arabic arabic country like you know you need to talk from that perspective if you're talking about russia you need to talk from that country like you know we taking picking examples from those countries and saying like hey we did talk about sex we did talk about sexuality so why can't we now like this is it, it's ridiculous so we need to just revert back to that uh, and like find uh, the uh, links in our history to make sure that we can move the uh, argument forward 
Great, thank you, thank you very much, Nipun. It's a really important uh, point that in many in many parts of the world, including the Middle East and North Africa, we were not always this closed around around sexuality, uh, and there is a long history to this, which we certainly don't have time to go into in this session. But absolutely, absolutely right. Um, uh, we're going to switch tracks a little bit, and because there are a lot of questions coming up in uh, in the chat. Uh, an excellent one from Gareth Jones about why are we always problematizing sex when we uh, talk about it for young people? Why don't we talk about pleasure? Well, this is exactly where we're heading in the second part of, or this third part of the session. Uh, we save the best for last. Uh, this is the climax of our session. So we are going to look at um, real life solutions to the problems on the ground. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, Pony White. Pony is an SRHR activist, and she works with advocates for youth in the U.S. Uh, advocates has a wide array of programs attempting and succeeding in really securing young people's sexual and reproductive health and rights in uh, the U.S. and around the world. Um, again, picking up on the pleasure principle, advocates is always looking at ways that young people will connect with these issues, um, and part of that is a humor. Uh, and so we're going to show a video now, which comes from an advocate series. Uh, they're working in collaboration with other entities. Um, it's called the Amaze Videos. They're online sexuality education uh, videos. Um, you'll get a flavor of advocates approach from the video we're going to show you now. It's a compilation uh, from uh, in a number of languages. It's been shown internationally. Uh, and uh, the website for Amaze is also in the video clip if you're interested in following up. So could we hit the video, please? Someday, what may seem unbelievable now will likely happen. Someone will agree to have sex with you. Congratulations. Hey, didn't you forget something? Yes, that's important too, but I'm talking about condoms. It's a good idea to use condoms when you have sex. Mm -hmm. Condoms are an effective method for preventing pregnancy, as well as mm -hmm. HIV and other STDs. Okay, I see that you need some help. Let me give you some tips on how to properly use a condom. <laughs> Bamba ingam leya so ukupe umoya o koyo guso wandule ukustwa bulula. Ikai no seiko igoto ni hitotsu no kondomu o tsukau koto. Shasei shita ato, mada bokki shite iru aida ni danseiki o nuko. Kondomu ga hazure nai yoni danseiki no nemoto de osaite ne. Unos condones tienen lubricantes para hacerlos más cómodos durante el sexo. Mientras tanto, otros no los tienen. Los condones no lubricados pueden ser usados con lubricantes a base de agua. Como los comerciales que puedes conseguir en la farmacia junto con los condones. Great. So, um, Pony, uh, we want to talk a bit about the, your work at Advocates as a young person and as a young activist. Tell us a little about the range of issues and the really tough issues that Advocates is uh, addressing uh, and encouraging, empowering young people to address. And could you also speak in particular about your own work as a youth uh, lobbyist? in government circles in your home state of Minnesota to really achieve the access to sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, that uh, you and your peers are looking for. Over to you, Pony. Yes, thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone else that's on this chat. Um, it's super early on my end, but hello. Um, and I would say two big main points that I want to um, highlight um, that's very important about the work, that, the work that we do at Advocates is one, um, understanding that young people are human. Um, I think in a lot of the conversations, even a question that got asked earlier of like, how come we're still having the same conversations? Um, and, and you said um, when, when older people get past the threshold of 35, it's like they forget that they were young people. Um, I think more so is that they begin to dehumanize young people because they're disassociated from youth. Um, and, and so at Advocates, we like to understand that young people, even as early as, and, and Amaze does a great job as bringing in uh, young people as early as like eight and, you know, and five and helping parents have a conversation about uh, sexual health and, you know, uh, uh, how to, how young people can protect themselves and what they need to know when they're out there. Um, 
and that's that's what we do because we understand that young people are being in, uh, impacted by sex, whether it is them, you know, choosing consensually to engage in sex as human beings that deserve full autonomy of their bodies, or whether it, it is their their young people in spaces that are not safe, um, in home conditions that um, they might be around, you know, someone who is a predator, um, and how to have a conversation to let them know that it's okay to talk about sex. It's okay to um, express what's happening to you. It's okay to know like these are good touches, these are bad touches. And so I think that's one great thing that um, we do at Advocates and that really leads our work. Um, a second thing is that we understand that um, all of this, so sexual and reproductive health and rights is a gateway to a lot of different liberation movements. Um, as a Black woman who is deeply rooted in Black liberation work um, and someone who is currently in the Minneapolis, Minnesota area, um, I've seen firsthand the different uh, systemic violence and I've also experienced systemic violence from you know policies and government work. Um, and sometimes people ask like, well, you're rooted in reproductive health rights. Like, how does that, you know, like come in with, you know, racial equity um, or, you know, gender equity? And I'm like, it, it's it's a gateway. It's it's the it's a tool, you know, to for all, all forms of liberation, um, because when we look at the the uh, prison pipeline for, you know, black people and black uh, specifically black women and girls and um, uh, gender nonconforming people, black women and girls and gender nonconforming people are three times more likely to go to prison, three times more likely to, you know, be kicked out of um, expelled from school and sent to juvenile detentions. Um, and then there's another study that shows that 80% of those uh, women who, you know, were in prison systems expressed that they were uh, victims of sexual violence before the age of 17. Um, so like that's that's rooting us as, as how how connected and integral like all of this is to the work that we're doing in different liberation movements. Um, specifically speaking on the work that I've done with Advocates for Youth, um, I've been working with Advocates since I was 18 years old. Um, and it's, it seems so crazy now because it feels like just yesterday. Um, but I have worked on campaigns in my state um, to fight for inclusive, comprehensive sexual education, um, first on my campus community and then broaden my horizons to thinking, hey, like, why can't we, why can't this be, you know, a state law? Like, why can't we have all schools teach inclusive, comprehensive, age appropriate, culturally relevant um, sexual education that can speak to all youth of all, all of all demographics, all races, all genders, all sexualities, um, all income levels. Um, and then I, when I do work on a national level with advocates, we've worked on things like the Global Her Act, um, opposing the global gag rule. Um, um, we've worked on thing, uh, different policies uh, to prevent um, abstinence only um, sexual education because we know um, statistics and uh, researchers show that um, abstinence only does not work. Um, in fact, it increases a lot of the risks that young people are experiencing, HIV, um, sexual violence, um, uh, lack of access for, you know, especially for queer youth who, all of the numbers and all of the things that we are listing and we are talking about, it's extremely exacerbated for um, queer youth. It's extremely exacerbated for youth of color. Um, it's extremely exacerbated for youth experiencing poverty. Um, and so like when, when, we, when we're talking about that, we're centering ourselves in this conversation. I always like to bring that up because sometimes the people who are making the decisions for us are people who are middle class, people who are um, do not experience racial oppression, do not experience gender-based oppression, um, and they get to sit in the rooms and they get to decide what our lives look like and what we need. When at the end of the day, like they can they can pass uh, uh, policies like you know abortion bans and they can pass policies that prevent young people from having access to condoms. And then they can easily go ahead and have the finances and the means to afford condoms and have the means to um, uh, get abortions. Um, another fact that I'm going to present is we know that most abortions, because people sometimes think that abortions are being had by young people who have no idea what they're doing. Most abortions are had by middle class white women, women who have had children before. Um, and this is a choice of theirs. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we were looking at that again as sometimes this is the demographic deciding that nobody else should have the right to decide what to do with their bodies in a situation like that. But they have the means and the rights um, and, and, and the abilities to do all of those things. Um, and so I think 
that ties a lot into the work that we do at Advocates. Um, and I'm glad that you shared that video because like, like I stated before, we are definitely rooted in understanding that young people are the future and not just as tools, right, of liberation. Because I think a lot of the times when we say young people, young people, we're sitting in a room full of people who are no longer young people um, and who are talking about young people as if they're props rather than as full beings who need to be at the center of these conversations, who need to be making these changes, who need to be in the room. Um, as someone also speaking on sexual violence, as someone who was a victim of sexual violence at a very young age, before the age of seven years old, I always think it's very interesting when people say we don't want to talk about sex because we don't want young people having sex or we don't want young people thinking this is okay. And I'm here to say that a lot of young people are experiencing se sexual encounters that they're they're not they don't fully understand or they are not ready for um, because there's someone else introducing them to that. And the work that we're doing is not saying like, oh, we're telling anyone what to do. We're giving uh, young people the tools to make the best decisions for their life, to be well educated and have full knowledge and understanding of what they're doing so that they can be Com complete autonomous beings um, um, and, and you know, f uh, living life that's uh, very fulfilling for them. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's what I have to say on the work that we do. Um, and I hope I answered all of your questions. Thank you. And then some, thank you, Pony, and lots of comments uh, coming in. Uh, thank you for sharing all these really very important points about the intersectionality. I mean, we, we have a tendency to homogenize young people, but of course, such diversity and this needs to be accounted for. And thank you also for making, again, this point that's coming up time and again, is that you know the political is personal, the personal is political. All this empowerment in our intimate lives connects into our public lives uh, as well. Uh, so thank you for bringing those points home. Uh, we're gonna build on Pony's uh, remarks um, with our next speaker who's Abir Saras. Uh, Abir is an SRHR media expert. Uh, she's originally uh, uh, she's Palestinian, uh, she's based in the Netherlands, and she's the co-founder of Love Matters uh, Arabic. Uh, we're going to be hearing uh, more from Abir on a topic that's swirled around in multiple contributions about the role of the internet, SRHR, beyond porn, clearly. How do we communicate? How are young people expressing themselves? How are experts getting the ideas across? Uh, on SRHR. Um, it's very interesting to look at how Love Matters in particular, picking up on the pleasure principle, has uh, approached, has broached these topics. Uh, and really the challenge here, Abir, is how do we take the online world and actually translate it into offline changes in attitudes, practices, and behaviors? Over to you, Abir. Uh, thank you, Shireen. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, very interesting um, dialogue. Um, as Mir Shireen mentioned, I've been working on SRHR uh, in the MENA region for the past 10 years. And you might think, oh, I, I think uh, a lot of you will say, well, MENA, that's the last place you uh, should be talking about sexuality. Well, it's a place where we have been able to uh, really ma make, in my opinion, significant uh, change. Yes, the MENA region is a very restrictive region in terms of uh, taboos, myths, uh, misconceptions about sexuality that create a lot of problems uh, for people also, for young people later in life. It's a region where the, there's a huge youth bulge. Two thirds of the population is under 30 years of age in Egypt, for example. Um, the speakers already mentioned how young people are sexually active, whether we know uh, or don't, whether we like it or not. Um, yet this group is actually the group that is not really being reached by uh, services. So in the Middle East, uh, most SRHR services uh, target married people. And, and so a group of unmarried uh, young people don't really have those uh, services. It's a region where there's a lot of uh, um, harmful practices, FGM, uh, widely practiced in, in Egypt, uh, in Sudan, uh, child marriages as well. One in every five girls marry under the age of 18 in the, in the MENA region. And on top of all of this, we have very little uh, comprehensive sexuality in, in schools. There are some good examples in countries like Tunisia, uh, Oman as well. Uh, but I think across the board, you can say that CSE is virtually uh, uh, non-existent, uh, especially in government uh, schools. 
so this this uh, you know this has created a big void for where do young people actually find this information? Uh, some find it through uh, through porn. I, I looked up how many visits Pornhub um, got last not last year in 2019. It was 42 billion visits to one website. Of course, there are many uh, porn websites, and it was just really very amazing to see. Um, so that void, uh, there's a big void, and uh, yet, uh, from what I have seen in the past 10, uh, 10 years, uh, we managed to actually fill that void with working on SRHR um, digitally. And in this five minutes, I will talk about, uh, briefly talk about Love Matters Arabic, which is a website uh, platform uh, that I have helped co-create uh, in Egypt in 2014. It's still online, so that's great. And uh, since 2014, we uh, were able to get 30, 30 million uh, visits uh, to the platform. What's unique about Love Matters is that it addresses all issues of SRHR uh, in the Arabic language language, uh, very important because there's a lack of information in the Arabic language uh, on these topics. And it talks about uh, SRHR also integrating the, the pleasure approach. So not uh, only uh, disease prevention and birth control, but talks about uh, pleasure, uh, relationships, uh, communication within the relationships. And uh, Luck, Love Matters Arabic is, is not really a standalone platform. It's part of a global uh, network. I think my colleagues will show also parts of um, uh, or screenshots of the different um, uh, of the different uh, uh, websites of Love Matters. So uh, it's actually now existent in seven different languages, and I later on I will put the links to the different language websites um, in the chat if you want to visit it. So we're talking Chinese, uh, Spanish, Hindi, uh, Arabic, of course, uh, French. Um, different languages and the uh, the network is also growing. And what's unique about this project is that it's a combination of media and SRHR. So the people who are creating this information uh, are people who are on the ground. I know that in Egypt, for example, half of the team is our medical doctors. And the other half are people who are really uh, crafting, you know, uh, media messages, uh, uh, digital marketing, so really on the on the digital uh, side. And the websites use different formats, so videos. Uh, uh, we see here some uh, of the vloggers. One is Sandrine Atalla, for example, one of our very few sexologists in the Middle East. Uh, but they're also working offline with uh, existing partners. Uh, for example, in Egypt, we've done training for the IFIMSA, which is the um, Medical Students Association. Um, I will put the links to the websites in there, and uh, we were planning to show also a video of one of our vloggers live feeding on the Facebook uh, uh, page, but we'll maybe we'll just share the link uh, for later, uh, Shirin, just to get uh, things uh, uh, moving in, in uh, now. Um, I wanted to maybe just end my uh, intervention by talking about what, you know, what has worked and what hasn't worked in the digital space. Um, from this, this one hour, I'm hearing, you know, we can't, we can't. Yes, we can if we go digitally. And we have been able to achieve quite a lot of uh, results when we go um, digitally. Um, some of, you know, I think uh, Jana mentioned during COVID, when, when, because you are working digitally and delivering SRHR, you're able to adapt very quickly. So when COVID-19 uh, broke, we, you know, we, we continued our work and continued uh, reaching to young people online. Um, young people, whether you know it or not, they are already online. Of course, there are many limitations in terms of cost and not everyone is online, but increasingly more and more young people are going online and having access to their own uh, mobile applications or mobile uh, devices. Uh, so for us as experts and organizations, we really need to go where young people are. So if they are using a certain, you know, if they're using TikTok or they're using Facebook, that's where we, uh, you know, can reach them with our programming. Um, I was really happy to see the Amaze video because this is one of the points I wanted to make in this discussion is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel if you want to go more digital. There are a lot of uh, you know, initiatives and a lot of resources uh, that are out there that you can adapt uh, and, and contextualize for your uh, setting. And uh, yeah, I know that 
uh, my colleagues in Egypt are also thinking about dubbing some of the amazing videos uh, in Arabic. Of course, not all of it will be suitable for the Arabic context, but it's uh, it's great because we don't have to reinvent the wheel as a as an organization. Um, and Shireen, you touched on the online and the offline. I think it's uh, really important to mention that going digital, reaching young people digitally does not cancel offline because young people still need to go get the test. They need the services. So it's really reinforcing each other rather than uh, uh, you know, canceling each other. Uh, of course, there are a lot of challenges with working online on, in, on SRHR. A lot of organizations I talk to, they think, okay, well, we'll just make a training manual, we'll put it online, and the magic will happen. Well, it doesn't happen. A project like this really needs investment. As I mentioned, we have 10 people working only on the Arabic uh, website. So you need resources, you need knowledge, you need human uh, capital. It's not only making a couple of posts and putting them on your social media. Um, I think my colleague Nippon mentioned this, uh, the, the issue of sensitivity. Uh, it's very important that when you're working on a topic like SRHR to really work contextually, uh, have the people in the region, young people in the region really create their own information, create their own resources, because they know, you know how far you can go in these discussions and what's allowed and what's not, uh, uh, what's not allowed. Um, and I want to stress, uh, again, going back to the fact that we don't cancel each other, you know, um, uh, online work remains limited, you only can reach people who have access to the internet, so it's important that you work offline with, uh, with existing organizations and reinforce each other in that uh, sense. And online work has limitations. When we talk about CSE in schools, we talk about the systematic gradual curriculum. Whereas when we talk about uh, online, you know, I can't guarantee that someone who's coming to uh, on, online is gonna follow the, you know, follow the, uh, the scheme from A to Z. They might come into uh, on, on Z as an example. I want to wrap here and say, you know, uh, going back to my point, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And I was really glad to see in the last couple of um, years that there are some really great guidelines and resources from uh, UNESCO and from the WHO that are out there uh, that can guide organizations who want to work more in the digital space. Thank you. Um, Shireen, over to you. Many thanks, Abir. Uh, yes, uh, the Facebook Live that we were hoping to show you, it's really fantastic viewing. Uh, and uh, we will put a link in the chat so that you can follow up uh, at your own convenience. Uh, we're gonna switch tracks a little bit and it's really building on Abir's uh, comments because it, fantastic these online resources are increasingly uh, accessible, uh, but there are still vast numbers of young people who don't have access to them. Uh, and so uh, it is important that we also look at complementary approaches to providing services and providing information. And clearly schools are one of the key uh, fora for that. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Stefania Giannini, who's Assistant Director General for Education at UNESCO. As I'm sure you're all aware, UNESCO has been leading efforts to support country implementation of the UN guidance on comprehensive sexuality education. Uh, hello, uh, Stephania. Um, we want to just hear from you, how is that process going globally? Uh, what are some of the challenges that countries are facing? Uh, and then how have you been able to maneuver around these obstacles to get uh, this information to young people who need it? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shirin, uh, for having me. And the greetings from Paris to all of you. Uh, well, while listening to, before addressing the questions with pleasure, uh, while listening to these inspiring presentations, I uh, was thinking that uh, what we are talking about is uh, definitely freedom, freedom of choice, uh, giving young people tools uh, to make the best choice for their life. Just quoting from Pony presentation, if I heard correctly, one of the, the powerful messages uh, she gave to us. And uh, indeed, wh when it comes to sexuality education, uh, 
let me say it's not a question uh, of either or, or. <laughs> young people need and deserve a range of uh, different sources of accurate age appropriate information about the health the rights and sexuality in school and out of school online and at home interesting data and experience already uh, just shared by, by Aber in, in their presentation as well, uh, together with parents and with peers. And the only wrong approach, it must be very clear, is no approach at all. <laughs> Why that? Because uh, it leaves young people deprived uh, of this uh, freedom of choice, uh, deprived of life-changing, um, potentially life-saving information about their health and their rights. Uh, no girl should ever go through their experience of menstruation uh, for the first time without knowing what's happening to her. No young person should ever be denied their right to education because they are victim of violence, bullying, uh, discrimination at school, or don't know where to turn for help. No young me women uh, who should be deprived uh, of a right to education because uh, she falls pregnant. And I, I should continue in the list of what you're looking around the globe. More and more countries, and this is the positive uh, uh, point I wish to, to, to stress, uh, have been recognized uh, this, uh, the importance of, this, of these issues uh, uh, and getting behind uh, education uh, uh, is delivered differently through different names all around the world. Just like for many other subjects, uh, each country's sexuality education programs look differently depending on their context and culture. This is a very culture-oriented uh, approach we need. However, these programs should all convey certain essential knowledge and skills that young people need to build safe, healthy, and equitable futures. This include, uh, includes, of course, uh, HIV prevention and treatment, but also general life skills, such as decision-making and communication. I think the chain of values we are building is uh, uh, through knowledge, awareness, uh, and, uh, and uh, behaviors and attitude to change and to, and to, cho and to choose. Uh, because uh, so many countries have been making progress on sexuality education, it can be challenging to get a clear sense uh, of where we stand globally. Uh, for this reason, UNESCO has developed uh, with other UN agency uh, partners, uh, as already mentioned, thanks for that, uh, by, by Abir before, a landmark new report, uh, which will be launched in the coming weeks. Uh, the title is uh, uh, The Journey Towards Comprehensive Sexuality Education, a Global Status Report. And it, 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 tell us, um, it tells us uh, that while a tremendous amount of program has been made, the positive news, we still have a long way to go in our, in our uh, common agenda. Uh, let me mention some uh, really few data about two thirds of reporting country state that between 70 and 100% uh, uh, of the schools in their country uh, were providing some kind of sexuality education. Um, and however, you know, sexuality education and other related topics uh, like uh, uh, teaching about genetic life skills, uh, uh, sexual and reproductive health, and HIV prevention. And this is good. However, if you go deep diving, uh, these findings may depict a, an overly optimistic picture uh, because coverage data doesn't address uh, the more complex question of quality of curriculum content and delivery. And, and it's still the, the real, um, the real um, uh, obstacle or somehow the challenge we are facing when they're talking about this kind of issues, uh, the, the question of how can we measure the impact of this, of this uh, uh, you know, curriculum development and content already included in uh, education systems. For example, research on student perspectives shows clearly that they often feel that they received information too late. And this is an important uh, enabling or not enabling factor. In uh, a nine, uh, 2019 uh, online survey um, from UNESCO, over, uh, over 1,000 uh, and more 
uh, young people from uh, uh, 27 countries reflected on their experience uh, of sexuality education and less than one in three uh, believe that their school taught them about sexuality very well or some uh, some uh, uh, what well so that means that sometimes tools are there but the the the, the perception from beneficiaries of these tools learners uh, uh, are not exactly the same as we expected so this underscores another important uh, in, important dimension, the need for a more learner-centered approach. Uh, we must listen to young people, uh, uh, what we are doing uh, uh, in this, in this uh, discussion today, and, and put ourselves in their shoes to ensure that education they are receiving is relevant and meaningful to them. Uh, another uh, another note uh, was taken. Uh, understanding young people are human. Uh, still from from a pun in, uh, presentation. Well, there is no how can I say knowledge pill uh, that we can give young people. You know, and say take it and and you know and you are and you are ready to go. Uh, but education hand in hand with access to youth friendly services is the most powerful tool uh, we have uh, for ending uh, uh, AIDS uh, as a public health treat uh, and protecting uh, the health and rights for future generation. Uh, yet just uh, as early HIV activists taught us the important principle of nothing about us without us. <laughs> uh, today, we must learn from them and sure that sexuality education and social reproductive health services are truly inclusive uh, uh, of young people's perspective and experiences and uh, leave no learning behind. Uh, this is our message, this is our approach, and this is from UNESCO, our common mission that we are happy uh, to share with all of you. I thank you very much. Over to you, Shirin. Many thanks, uh, Stefania. Uh, going to pick up on a couple of these points. We're actually running a bit over time, which is great for a session. It shows that we have a lot of engagement. We have a lot of questions. Uh, we're going to have to wrap up at uh, in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, I'm going to pick up on some of the questions. There are lots and lots of comments. Please, again, go to the chat. Fantastic exchange of experiences and expertise there. Um, but uh, just some, some recurrent themes, and I'll just mention a couple of these questions. One question is coming from uh, Sonal Mehta, our colleague uh, at IPPF. Uh, there is this uh, concern amongst older folk that talking about queer issues to young minds can actually make young people queer. This is a fear for many adults. What do the young people on the panel say to this? Okay, let's start with Nippon. Over to Yana and then uh, Pony, if you'd like to uh, uh, weigh in on this. And if you can keep your responses brief, sorry, lots of questions, so little time. Over to you. Sure. Um, I think I answered queer so no, in, the, in the comments. I believe that you, if you talk about queer issues, it doesn't, just because you talk about queer issues doesn't make you queer. It will not make you queer. Um, just like, you know, you, how you talk about animal rights and it will not make you a damn animal. So just make sure that uh, you keep, it, it, queer issues are important and we need to talk about them. Um, there's no to if and but and where and should we or not. Um, that's, that's what I would like to say to that question. Great. Uh, Yana. I think it should be important if in all our work, we need to work as a peer to peer. And of course, we need to keep in mind about psychological support as a peer-to-peer -peer also. So that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, this point about, you know, if we talk about it, suddenly it will happen and we will induce it. We'll suddenly plant this in young minds if we actually mention it is not just an issue when it comes to LGBT, LGBTIQ. It's, it's across the board on youth SRHR. This is the fear. Of sexuality education. If we talk about it, they will come, as it were. Pony, any thoughts about this? Yeah, I, I would say that's very inaccurate. Um, I haven't really found a whole lot of like 
fact based things in that. Um, what I will say is teaching young people about queer identities um, makes them more accepting, um, makes gives them more knowledge on themselves, on everyone else. Um, and the same could just be said about any other demographic that has experienced oppression, teaching uh, young people who have no understanding of racial oppression about, you know, racism just makes them more aware. Um, it doesn't now make someone decide, hey, I think now I want to be a Black person who's oppressed. Um, and so I just think that is just a tactic that just just gas just gaslighting um it's it's not rooted in a lot of facts so okay i think we put paid to that thank you very much um, i want to pick up on another point i mean we're talking a lot about educating young people but in my experience in working in the field of sexuality one of the issues that's often overlooked is actually educating parents and older people just because you've had sex or you've had children does not make you an srhr expert and very often that element of older people is, is missed out. And very often I find that older people react from a position of resistance and conservatism, because frankly, when they're confronted with a young person who has questions, they actually have no idea what they're talking about. So they tend to default to tradition and what they were taught because they didn't have the benefit of CSC or access to a broader suite of SRHR services. I, Alvaro, others on the panel, Stefania, what about, so, how are we going to reach out and actually educate uh, parents and other um, people and uh, older people in positions of authority? Thanks, um, Serene. And I think it's it's a very good point. We first the word education sort of tends to in people's minds to sort of mean from older to to younger, which is already a problem, particularly when talking about um, sex education. So we, we, we need to keep repeating that the importance of peer to peer, but also the importance of educating, bringing the community, I would say more generally, we've seen many examples. I mean, I can tell you, um, research we did showed in Nigeria in super important to uh, work with parents and to bring them along. We saw very good uh, improvement in the results when we did that. In other countries, it's been less so. So I guess it is the importance of knowing what the reality is in each country and in doing sort of uh, human-centered design and understanding the situation. But it's, it's, it's clear that um, Young people need to be at the center, but they don't need to be alone. In most places, you need others to come uh, with them in that process. Many thanks, Elbro. Um, anyone else on the panel who'd like to address this particular topic? Stefania, Amory, others? Yeah, thank you. If I may jump uh, quickly on this point. I think educating parents uh, is the other side of the coin. It's, it's a very important uh, part of the work. Uh, UNESCO has absolutely this approach and uh, uh, how we can reach out to them effectively. I think it's about framing learning as, not, uh, a, pro as a process which is not exclusively part of the you know, curricular development and uh, uh, interaction between the teachers and students uh, within the classroom. Learning is a very much beyond the building of schools as being the schools, of course, at the center of the community. So keeping the community as the reference uh, of the learning process uh, is very much what you are trying to do in our program on that side and many others. Many, th many thanks. Uh, we've had a question, interesting one, which is directed specifically to Abir, but is also relevant for others on the call. And it's, Abir, this is from Manuel, and she mentions that uh, you're talking about some of the success of uh, Love Matters and that it is uh, culturally, uh, culturally sensitive. But then the, the question emerges, but then how can, if, if we're only, if we're always sticking within the cultural bounds, which can be very narrow, how do you then push ahead? How do you push the envelope? Where do you strike that balance between uh, challenging, but also not pushing too far that there's so much pushback that you can't move forward at all? Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that balance? Yeah. And others also, because it's relevant to other, other regions of the world. From my experience, you have to take it one step at a time. Uh, sometimes you go two steps and come back three steps back. Uh, to give you an example, Manuel, uh, you know, addressing the issue of uh, safe abortion 
I, I have a million people on the community. So if I just carry the flag and say, you know, every woman has the right to safe abortion, they'll shut me down. What I can do is I can say, hey, every woman who's had the horrible experience of, of seeking an, an, an illegal uh, and unsafe abortion, which is a very uh, practiced, uh, it's very wildly practiced in, in countries like Egypt, these women have the right to post uh, uh, abortion care. So step by step, you take the community into thinking, okay, why did these women even went in that direction? What's happening and raising that awareness. Another tactic that worked very well with us is that, you know, when you profile yourself as a, a, a website that talks about a medical scientific perspective, you're replying, you know, my colleagues reply as doctors. So a, a doctor uh, should be able to address any issue. Um, and that gives you, at least in our region, always a, a sort of, a, yeah, a stronger ground to, to stand on. Uh, everything we did, we have to do it step by step. If I talk about, you know, if I start talking about uh, female masturbation that, you know, women have to, uh, women practice, it, it, it's a very uh, sensitive topic. I can address it to uh, sim in a simpler way and say, you know, what if uh, your husband uh, has passed away or is working as an expat? What do you do? How do you, uh, you know, how do you uh, help yourself? So it's really about, you know, those finding these entry points. And again, um, you know, having a solid, having a medical staff working on this is, is really has been uh, great because, uh, we are in a region that really believes in doctors and everyone wants to be a doctor. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's one of the tactics that has, uh, that has worked. Um, yeah, this, uh, those are some of the tips I can think of quickly. That's great of you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, we could spend the rest of the day in this conversation and I wish we could, but alas, we have to wrap up now. So I really want to thank all the speakers uh, and the audience have been really, truly wonderful, passionate, personal um, exchange of views and experiences. I, I, I'm, over, I'm sure we're capturing this because it, it, it's, it, it deserves its own uh, pride of place in this, uh, in this session. Uh, we're, we're just going to wrap up to actually uh, really the final word to uh, the young people on our panel. And very briefly, just one thing, you're speaking to those in power, whether it's politicians or family members uh, or in the community, your peers, what's the one thing that you say needs to change for you to be able to live your sexual and reproductive life to the fullest? Over to you, Nathan. I would say enough talk about birds and bees, let's talk sex. Um, there is no other alternative except to just like, you know, not talking about this issue at all. Um, yeah, there's simple, simply no other alternative. So let's, let's really tackle the facts of life. Straight talk on sex. Yes. Thanks, Nipun. Yana. Stay safe, use condoms, and also work together. Excellent. To the point. Uh, Pony. I would say stop politicizing human rights. Um, I think when it becomes a political issue, it becomes difficult to tackle. But if we looked at it just as people deserve rights and they deserve health, um, then that's just what it is. But when it becomes a conservative versus a liberal thing, then people feel like they need to stick with their politics and sometimes not with their humanity. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This has really been uh, a terrific session. And, be, and believe you me, this is not the final word. This is the beginning of the conversation, which we very much look forward to continuing in other for fora and when COVID permits, in person, inshallah. So thank you for joining us. It concludes this session. Um, have a good day. Thank you.